they're not educated enough in the in the history end of things to realize that we're repeating ourselves, mm. we're falling right back into that old cycle. Yeah, or, and, and yeah. then we're we're slaves again. Well, welcome to the show. Thank you. I appreciate you coming down and. Uh, I always tell people I'm a longtime libertarian. The funny thing, though, is even though I don't like labels, that's the closest thing that kind of defines my philosophy. Sure. And I remember when I got into cryptocurrencies about seven years ago, reading about Bitcoin, and that's the first time I came across a word libertarian. Then I went to Wikipedia. I started reading. There's obviously different philosophies. So I'm like, and this is my whole life. Right. <laughs> I think I think anybody who defines himself as a libertarian, when the, when that flashpoint goes off in their mind, like I've been this, mo- this is what I've been forever. I just didn't realize that there was actually a definition. A for definition, it. yeah, yeah. I couldn't believe it. I was actually like in awe. I'm like, wow, there's a movement, and I went down the rabbit hole. And before this, we're talking about Ayn Rand, reading Atlas Shrugged, yes. you know, all her literature. Uh, then g- getting into once you go on crypto, understanding different economic models, so Keynesian versus Austrian, versus diving so. into uh, Mises and, and Milton Friedman and all the more or less, you know, Austrian economists and understanding. Yeah. And for me, it's like, I'm not a mathematician, but when I see something of like very ba- basic math, I'm like supply and demand, hard money, you know, so removing it from the state. I'm like voluntary to interaction between people. I'm, like a, I'm an economist, but that kind of makes sense to me. You sure. know, common sense. That's right. And, and, and I'm a bricklayer by trade, so it's, it's not that I'm an economist or anything like that either, but it just made sense. You know, so when well, I- Well, you mentioned big, uh, bricklayer. I would, um, I would love for you to tell the story of how you got where you are today. Sure. Um, let's, let's start with uh, how I became a libertarian and got involved with the party. Great. So around 2008, I started watching uh, the American cycle and I saw that old guy, Ron Paul. Ah, yes. And he was holding up his silver dime when everybody's fighting about gas being too, you know, let's get it down to 250 a gallon. He said, I pay 10 cents a gallon. I don't know about you guys. He held up a silver dime and said, This is worth one gallon of gas. It's not the problem that the gas is costing too much, it's that your currency is is flawed. Go back to, to real money and it solves it. And I was mind blown. Like, wow, that, that makes sense. So you follow that and, and you, you live a little bit of life and then the government kind of comes in and gives you a kick in the ass and you start to realize that, you know what, maybe there's, there's a better way to do this. So around 2015, I saw Tim Moen and that was our, our last federal election for this one. And I, I, I really caught on to his message of salt of the earth guy, firefighter, awesome, solid message, well-spoken. And I jumped on board. So I, I, be, I became a member of the federal party. Um, and then in 2017, BC had their election. So I was looking for a home and they had a, they had a libertarian party in BC. There was 27 members of the party. So I took three guys, myself and two other guys. We went to the convention in Vancouver and we said, we're committed to make this party grow. So within that cycle, we went from 30 members of the party. Within seven months, we had 30 candidates running. Um, I was on stage at 420. They, they loved our, our platform for cannabis. Um, and we actually, we, we've made a dent. We're up BC now has the largest provincial libertarian party. They have over 300 really? members. In British Columbia. We, wow. we, we grew that Incredible. From, from nothing. Cause so, I remember when I lived in BC it was. Well, and it's hardcore like, liberal and they, they still are, <laughs> but beyond just a regular, not classical liberal. I'm talking no, about and, like, and they're sliding green yeah. like, and, and, and they're, they're very left, but there's the other side of that. There's the people that are outside of Vancouver who just want to be left alone. They want to hunt, they want to fish, they, mm-hmm. want, they want their own rights to, to do these things. Mm-hmm. So there is that, that side there. So we grew that party really fast and, and saw that there was an uptake for libertarianism. And from that, I did a lot of hard work out there. And, and there's, there's a few other people. Clayton Wellwood was the party leader at the time. Um, Kyle McCormick, he's still with the party now out there. He does a lot of the media stuff. Um, really hardworking guys. And they have that, that message in their head. So then I moved back here in 2018. I went to the AGM for the Ontario Libertarian Party. And I saw that there's a, we're missing a leader. Alan Small had retired. Um, he's sick. And Rob Ferguson, great guy. Maybe not the best leader for the party at the time. 
So I sat down with Matt Doherty and I said, Matt, I'm going to run this party in, in a year. And he laughed at me. He said, there's no way. Like, there's so many people in, in front of you. But I had a mindset and I had a vision of, of where we needed to go mm. and put in the work, you know, just get out there and do the work. And I think that's the biggest problem with libertarians is, is we talk a lot and we like to sit on their computer and, and, and philosophize. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but nobody wants to lace up the boots, sure. right? Nobody wants to get, get dirty and get muddy. So I'm, I'm the opposite of that. I'm, I'm a guy who just runs into problems face first, whether I succeed or fail. And from that, I've earned my spot and we went to the convention here November 2nd and I won the leadership of the party. So that's what takes me to today and, and our, our new idea of how we're going to try to grow libertarianism in Ontario to the point that we're actually a viable party. Um, and so when people, usually when, we, when I say the word libertarianism, uh, we mentioned this earlier, people automatically presume anarchy. Yes. But that's not the case. What is the, I want to say philosophy, but what are, what are the kind of modus operandi of the Ontario Libertarian Party? Well, right now, our, our, our MO would be community-based solutions. Mm. We, are, we understand that the government right now, as it is, does a lot of favors for a lot of people and they, they, they really don't care about what the people are doing and they're not really into the, the solution side of things. So you have problems with housing, you have problems with, with welfare and income, you have all of these huge issues that are going on and there's really no solution to it. And we, we believe that the solution is at the community level. Every community can solve their own problems if they're just left to do these things. So what we would like to do is we'd like to get into Queens Park and we'd like to reduce the size of and scope of the regulations and leave it up to the, to the municipalities to, to take care of these issues, take care of affordable housing problems, take care of, uh, you know, if, employment. If, if a community wanted to open up a great big hemp factory right now, it's almost impossible. The, the legislation and the regulations that are in the way don't allow that to happen. Well, we, we would like to say, you know what, it's not up to us as a province. It's up to you as a community. If Bradford wants to do that or if, Toronto wants to do that. It should be up to them and, and let them solve their problems. So we're not, we're not about burning down government. And, and that's a huge, like you said, a huge knock on, on, on libertarianism is we all want to be free. We don't want government. Well, maybe in an end game, maybe 50, 60 years from now, once we've all got control of ourselves again, we could, we could have that conversation. But for now, let's just get out of the way of people solving problems and allow people to take some accountability and some responsibility in their own lives and, and fix these problems that are, that are being usually set up by government itself, right? Most of the problems that we run into, if you trace it back to the beginning, it's some type of legislation or regulation that started it. So what's a step forward though? Like if, if we're going to make a real push towards this, what needs to happen for the Libertarian Party to I want to say get in power. That's not a good, good definition. We don't want to take power. Yeah. We want to hold the public trust. And, and, and so how do we get into that situation? Um, usually it's, it's structure. So right now we're, we're in the process of setting up uh, co uh, constituency associations across the province. Um, there's 124 ridings. By the end of next year, we want to have 124 constituency associations. That'll allow each riding to start raising funds for themselves to uh, develop a local atmosphere and, and, and start generating that from the grassroots. Um, so that's the first thing we want to do. Um, secondly, we want to develop a proper platform. Uh, the thing that we're discussing right now is a decentralized platform. It's unheard of in politics today. Everything is one size fits all. It's either, you know, we're, we're going to do this and it's going to help this problem, this municipality, but it might hurt that one, but we're not worried about that. We're just going to pass legislation. What we would like to do is repeal all of that stuff and let the, the municipality set up their own little you know, kind of like a, a, a community type of government for themselves where they can solve their own problems and they can take care of their own issues at the community level. So that's, I think, the second thing. And third, we got to get out and we got to, we got to start knocking on doors and we got to shake hands and we got to, we got to get involved with planting trees. We've got to get involved with picking up garbage and helping out homeless and, and handing out coats. If you're truly a libertarian and you truly believe in, in responsibility and accountability, You've got to, you've got to do the work and you've got to show people that you're, you're willing to do that. And I think that the new board and the, the new people in the party that are, that are running it now have that mindset. So I think that's, you're going to see a lot of traction come from that 
alone. Do you see the demographics changing within the party or the interests of the libertarian movement? For sure. For sure. And, and the ANCAPs that, that were in the party have kind of just faded off into the sunset. They've, they're, they're disillusioned with where we're going. <laughs> they, 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 and, and it happens, right? Of course it's, it does. It, you see it happen in, in And every party is a splinter. It's, sure, yeah. and you see the conservatives do the same thing, liberals yeah. do the same thing. So we're, we're, we're pissing off the ANCAPs right now because we're willing to, instead of stand in the end zone and look for a 97-yard Hail Mary pass, which we know is not coming, we're willing to slowly move, the, move that, that ball down the field towards liberty. One piece at a time. So that's, that's a good thing, I think. And, and, and it's a lot more palatable than light it on fire and walk away. What are some legislations you would subtract or add that you think would, <laughs> I want to say drastically, but really change the environment to help people here? Uh, myself, I would love to take control of CPP and EI. Okay. They are provincial jurisdictions according to our constitution. So- before we continue, so for people who are listening that may not be familiar with that, so CC, C, CPP is Canadian Pension Plan. Yes. So same thing like United States, you're paying into Social Security. Yep. Percentage of your income with your employer goes towards your future pension. Yes. And at this point, the government holds that. Correct. So according to our constitution, we as a province can take that power upon ourselves and, and write our own rules. Quebec does it themselves. There's QPP and there's CPP. We would like to start, well, OPP, but it doesn't, yeah. <laughs> we're not going to arrest you with it, yeah. but um, we would like to set that up as a, as a private fund between you and your employer. So for an example, if you're making $20 an hour, you contribute $2 an hour and your employer matches that. Two bucks an hour, yeah. And you split that up. I would imagine heavy on the EI side to start with, a little bit light on the retirement fund because there's time for that to grow. But in, then instead of having to Beg the government for your money back. If you lose your job or you, you decide that you need to change or something has to happen, you just walk into the bank with your funds and, and, and grab them. And with that, you would have your own equity. So you want to buy a house, we've got asset. It's not a government fund anymore. It's now yours. I think that would do a lot to empower people in this province. That's, that's one legislation we would do. Um, I think another one is revamping welfare. Mm, I agree. I think, and, and, the way the retirement fund is set up right now is, is atrocious. These people have paid in hundreds of thousands of dollars their whole life. And now we to receive a thousand bucks a month. Yeah. Like what a joke. It's a joke. It sure it is. You, you, know, you and I were talking before the show. I'm like, even if you, if you put that money in the market, no matter what time in the market, any market, S and P TSX, sure. with, whether it's in an index fund of 5% per year, you are a thousand times exponentially better than what you get from the government. Sure. And the promise was made that you'd be taken care of. Yes. And then as the, the demographic shifted and we ran out of young people to fund this for the, for the retirees, it became a problem. But instead of addressing that as an issue and, and seeing that this is not going to be sustainable, they continue to fund it. So we need to get off of this. We need to get out of this program. And for the people that have paid in up to this point, I think we owe them a decent retirement. I agree. So anybody who's 50, 55, 60 years old is heading in there. I wouldn't so much as, as say change what they've done, but the younger people definitely privatize that for them so that they can have their own funds and have their own equity. And for the people who've paid in all these years, let's, let's give them a couple thousand dollars a month and, and allow them to at least live a, a decent end of life. Right. And it, it might cost us a few dollars, but the way the government throws money into the garbage can, I can't see a better way to spend that money. Mm-hmm. Right. If, if you're going to spend money, do it, do it honorably and, 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 and put it in a place that, that has some type of value. Right. And, and, and those people have paid in and, and supported us and looked after us for all these years. And it's a joke that, that we treat them the way we do. And same with disability, ODSP. Um, welfare. These these are programs that they're they're slavery. Slavery. Like, like you were saying. Oh, yeah, it's slave programs. Sure. There there is no end game for these people. And welfare is generational now. I know. Well, I say whoever designed the system. I haven't done my due diligence of looking the history of it, but just looking at it from observational aspect and seeing the policies they have. I'm like, whoever designed the system designed it purposely to be a slave system. This isn't by mistake. No, and, I, and so I think it's a it's a fifty fifty. There, there's the insidious side of it. The people who, who did wanted that to happen are like, yes, but we, back then we also printed our own money. So after we built the St. Lawrence Seaway 
and we built the Trans Canada Highway, and we built CN Rail, and we had all the hospitals and schools built. They needed a place to spend this money into existence. Mm-hmm. So that's where these social programs came from. That's where our healthcare, that's where EI and CPP started. It was a place to generate that currency and, and, and spend it into existence. And then in 74, when we changed that, it became a huge burden on us. Right? And that's, that's why we're in these, these situation we are now, is we no longer print that money. We no longer have control of that. And every dollar we print costs us a dollar five. So we're, we're screwed right from the get-go with, and, with the, the current system. And so what would you do to change the uh, welfare system? I like, and, and I take a huge knock from the party for this one, <laughs> because I, I see, I see a, a, an empowerment system. I see a disability empowerment system. So as we were talking earlier, there's, I see three types of disability. There's economic disability, there's physical, and there's mental disability. Mm-hmm. They're, they're all just as bad as, as, a, as a person to, to deal with these and things. And all connected. Sure. Yeah. And, and, and yes, sometimes two or three are, are yes. layered upon themselves. So instead of handing them a pittance, penalizing them for going out and working, let's, let's empower these people. Let's, let's retrain them put them back to school, put them in a trade school, teach them something of value, maybe a four or five year program that's a little bit front heavy on the money. And then in the back end, it's light because these people are now back in, into society and contributing mm-hmm. instead of this dole, right? That, that's what I would like to see. And I, I push in with the party for that. And I take a lot of heat for it, but I'm, I'm willing to stand on that and, and say, you know what? We can't, we can't just tear the system apart. Well, this is why I'm, one of my beefs about libertarianism and at the end of the day, ideally for me would be like, we talked about taxes. Sure. I believe without representation, there shouldn't be taxes. I think at least for me, the worst one is income tax. You're, yes. you're stealing my labor. Straight up. Like straight up. Yeah. It's slavery. I work, I put in labor and you take it away from me. And if I don't pay, I go to jail. That's right. I don't know what else you call that. That's right. Okay. I'm a realist though too. Yep. And I know for a fact, I'm not going to snap my fingers like, well, income tax gone. I can't. So, you and I were talking about this earlier. It's like um, accountability, transparency. Yes. It's like, even with these systems, it's like, I, what, regardless of what social program you have, or if you're taking whatever, you know, 13% for HST or whatever taxes, VAT tax, sales tax. I, I, in fact, from an from economics perspective, a moral ethics perspective, I... For me, I wouldn't feel that bad paying into taxes if I saw firsthand line items of where the money went, yes. which, which contractors received the bids, sure. and how the money was used for X, Y, and Z. Exactly. Zero line item, the budget. Yes. That, that would be the first thing. If, if, if libertarians ever got into Queens Park, the first thing we do is we take that $160 million or billion dollar budget and we throw it in the garbage can and say, come to me. Come to me with your program, show me your budget, and show me why you need that kind of money. And then from that, you're going to find a lot of redundancies. And we would, we would be able to peel a lot of those layers off. Um, big, big conversation that I, I was having the other day when we are talking about accountability is how the government, when they put out a budget, they skew the numbers for themselves. So even though it says that there's a $9 billion deficit, mm-hmm. they're really $16 or $17 billion in the hole. Because they, they split up their capital cost, their capital spending from their, their operating expenses. So any of their capital spending is off to the side. So you don't get to see that. And that's like a 20-year loan. So if they do a $12 billion project, it's going to cost you $18 billion. You don't get to see that. Yeah. So even though we're at it, even if they've had the budget balanced, you're still going to be going into debt because they, they separate it and they do it on purpose. Cause it, it's kind of like stealing 50 cookies out of the cookie well, jar. They all said the, the, what did he say? The uh, budget's going to balance itself. Yeah. Well, it does. Yeah. <laughs> you put it on top of this and it's going to balance. And, 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 and that type oh of, Oh my that, God. That type of economics is a joke. I know. And, and I don't understand how people don't see through that. And, and I get that. Okay. Sheer is, is what he is. And you, you might not like his policies. You might, you know, you, you don't like the social conservative aspect of him. Um, but why would you vote for somebody who's, who's so scandalous? If, if, if you don't like Sheer, you shouldn't like Trudeau. Because really, as far as I'm concerned, blue is the new red. 
they're they're the same. The oh, only, the I've only been difference that forever. These are the same parties. Sure. The only difference is the color of the business yeah, yeah, card. Yeah, totally. Right. Totally. So, one party system, as Noam Chomsky talks about. Yes. Yeah. And has been forever. Mm -hmm. Right. The, there is no real variance on the on the key issues. We still go to war. We're still back in the United States and all of their incursions around the world. We we still run deficits. Both sides of the party run deficits. The differences are literally like the, the color of the ice cream. It mm -hmm. still tastes like vanilla, but one is brown and one is blue. There is no substantial difference in them. So there are parties out there that, that do offer differences. But then the, the people say, well, you, you're, you're not going to win. And for whatever reason, our tribal response to that is yeah. I've got to vote for a winner. I've got, I've got to pick a winner. But I think things are changing. I think Trump, even though he's American, he's that catalyst for independent. I think so. He, like, regardless of if you like him or hate him, he is now a case study to be like an independent can win. Sure. But you know what? That, that study is being done by these two parties as well. Mm -hmm. And they have the funds and the money to implement a system to combat that. So we need to be very ultra aware of, of how that rolled out. And we need to, we need to start voting our conscience. We need to start being true to ourselves, regardless of the outcome, right? And, and, and I think that's the biggest problem is you need to let go a little bit. You, we, we inherently want control as, as humans. We want to control our destiny. And I think we need to just let that go and, and, and just vote our conscience. If, if you don't believe in either of those parties and you believe in, in the guy who's running for the rhinoceros party or there's an independent guy in your community that you really like, wasted or not, vote for him. Put your faith in this it. This is my problem with a lot of these parties as well is um, th this applies to both conservatives and liberals. You have, uh, you have eco chambers of both supporters screaming at each other. Sure. Uh, and it's all like groupthink. Mm -hmm. Then you have these leaders, different writings, and then you have the federal leaders, you know, Scheer and Trudeau talking. What I hear is blabble. In one ear out... I don't, I don't see policies, I don't see strategies, I don't see tactics from anybody. And for me, like as an entrepreneur, or you as, you know, as a tradesman, like yeah. I need a blueprint, I need to figure out, I, like this isn't just going to build itself. Like, That's right. I got to fucking see how this is going to be done. 100%. And for me, all these people talking, I'm like, I feel like I'm living in a cuckoo house. Well, you're not though, and it's not on purpose. They don't want to talk about any substance, they don't want to put anything on the table, right? It's, it's, it's all just, who do you hate the least? And, and, and that's how they, they run their, their campaigns. There's no, there's no substance to either of them. And, it, and so I'm at Elections Ontario today, mm. and, I'm, and I'm watching them roll out the new rules. We're going to change this. We're going to do that. And the only thing that those two big parties really cared about was the metadata. How, how am I going to track that person when he votes? Of course. If he moves from Ottawa to Toronto, I want his tracking number to follow him so I have real-time data that he voted. Because he was a conservative there. I want to know that he's voting conservative here. I want to know he's voting liberal here. They could care less about the rest of the rules changes. They really just want to know what you're doing at any given time so they can keep generating money from you. They want to make sure that you vote for them. I found that very telling. It was, it was an eye-opener for me. Do you think we have a better chance as like a libertarian movement to kind of win like it's easier for a small time mayor to be elected in like a small yeah. town and slowly from that community sure. grassroots move, as opposed to like, let's get a bunch of ridings in Ontario or sure. more seats with Toronto, which is like. It, it, you're, you're, I don't, I don't think we're going to find traction in Toronto yeah. to start. I think eventually we'll get there, but I think the first libertarian is going to get elected in Timmins or Kenora or sense. Thunder yeah, yeah. Bay where they they're, they're so disillusioned up there or maybe even Alberta now, or maybe, yeah. and, and, and I had that whole conversation about Wexit too. Wexit is not a cry for separation. It's a quiet a cry for a representation. Exactly. They don't feel represented. Exactly. So they're going to walk away. I've had this conversation with people. I'm like, regardless of if you like them or don't like them or don't agree with the oil industry, that's not the question. You don't understand them. There's no empathy. Sorry. I was talking to like environmentalists and this person intelligent person like we have to end the oil industry i'm like do you realize the whole province uh is supported by that industry i may agree with you some things need to change it's not going to happen overnight no you want to see a revolt you want to see a country separate you put you put a million people out of business sure but they can't get that no and and, and so what are you going to replace it with we live in a we live in a pretty cold country 
Fuck yeah. <laughs> what are you going to do when you can no longer drive and, and, and you can say electric car all you want. But I think people don't understand too, everything's oil. This table we're at, sure. oil. This is oil. This is oil. oil. Everything's oil. Everything is. The whole construction industry is oil. And, and the other side of that is the hemp industry is completely shut down. And you can produce all of these yes, plastics can. and everything out of hemp oil. Well, we got to get the lobby group. You got rapeseed in, which is the monocrop, which is canola oil, stands for Canada oil. Yes. And we were the number one hemp producer circa World War One. Yes. It, it grows quite well in Canada. Very well. And as you said, it's versatile, biofuel. Yeah. It's an organic um, uh, alternative to synthetics. Yes. Across the board. Across. There's, there's nothing that you can't do with cannabis. But you can't grow it. You're not allowed. You're not it's, allowed. it's right. Well, you, highly, you, highly regulated. You can, but yeah. it's regulated to the nth degree. And then like, even to the point where you've got a guy who goes around, he clips some of your bud off of your hemp plant to yeah. make sure that it's not actual THC cannabis. Yeah, it's, it's not it's female. Yeah. yeah. So it's ridiculous. It's virtue signaling at its, at its worst. You have all these guys screaming, kill the oil industry, kill the oil industry. But the politicians won't allow us to, to find the alternative. We have the alternative already. Mm -hmm. So if you were, if you were really serious about getting rid of the oil industry, you would see the, the hemp industry already flourishing and you need to do that for 10 or 15 or 20 years. You need to build the infrastructure before you can get rid of that oil because we still need to run our cars. We still need to heat our homes. Mm -hmm. We still need to wear our clothes. We still need our plastics. We still need all of these, these products. Yes. So it's great and fine that you want to get out of it, but where's your end game? And let's not walk away from something that works before we have something to replace it. I agree. Right. And, and hell or be damned with the environment. If, if we're going to freeze today, then we need to not freeze today. Cause if we freeze today, then we don't have a future in 25 years anyways, cause we're dead today. Mm -hmm. Let's not die in our virtue signaling on our way to, to getting rid of the oil industry. But this goes back to your community driven approach. Yes. Like I'm a firm believer in city states yep. or you can call them independent cities. Sure. Uh, you know, Switzerland's a good example. Wonderful model. Yeah. So, and this, this, I'm, I keep on mentioning this. You cannot please everybody on a national level. You yeah. have, you have, my problems in Toronto are very different than the problems of people living in Edmonton. Sure. When I lived in Kelowna, British Columbia, I had much different problems than I have right now in Toronto. Of course. You can't have a, a national policy that tries to fix everyone's problems. And you will fix them here and you'll fix them here and everyone else will suffer for that. Correct. So that's the problem with this is you're picking winners and losers when you're passing these one size fits all legislations. And that's why the federal government was supposed to be restrained to very simple things. Make sure you have a currency, make sure you have defense, you know, make sure that you have a judiciary system and, and a police force. That's all the federal government. I know. Really I, I had a friend of mine, a lawyer. He's like, Amir, go read uh, our, uh, our constitution, page 9, 10, 11. You'll see what the, what the federal government only should do. Yes. This is in our constitution. Sure it is. But they do everything. They, and, and in lieu of the provinces stepping up and taking that authority, that's why, why we don't have our own EI or our own CPP in this province is because they don't, they don't have the will. But how did Quebec pull off? The, uh... And, and look, at, look at how Quebec's the separatist. Quebec is, is the one who has their own CPP. Quebec is the one who says we're going to write our own laws for Muslims. We're going to write our own... And, and right or wrong, they take it upon themselves to use that constitution for their own benefit. Well, I'll give you an example of the, did a law that fucked them when it comes to economics. They had the um, mandatory French language laws, I think it was the 70s, yep. and Sun Life Insurance. Like Montreal was the ec economic powerhouse of Canada. It was the hub. Before Toronto. People think it's Toronto. No, it's was, it was Montreal. And they put this new French law in it, and all the big uh, banks, insurance they pulled out. Like, yep. Bye. There you go. And, and look at their license plate to this day, Je me souviens. Je me souviens, yeah. I will remember. <laughs> that's what that says. Wow. And that's in reference to you, le you left us. Yeah. So now, here they are taking billions of dollars from other provinces and transfer payments. They're the only province with a surplus. And yet we're still transferring money from Alberta. We're still yeah. transferring money from Saskatchewan to Quebec. What is that about? What, where does that make any sense? It doesn't. Down the line, it doesn't. He, there's a nanny state of, of, of our country. They're, they're the child yeah. that we babysit. They have all kinds of natural resources they could develop themselves, but they're oh, yeah. gonna, they'll sit there and virtue signal and say, all oh, oil's bad. Don't run a pipeline here, but give me the funds from it, which is, is a sad joke. And that's, that continues to split us apart. So 
shrink the government down. Get get that federal government back to what it's supposed to be. I agree. I've always I've always had this idea before. I'm not too sure if anyone has in the past tried to do something like this, but technically speaking, we do have city states in Canada. Sure. Aboriginal land. Yes. If you look at from like an outside perspective, it's like pretty much a city state. Yep. You have your own rules, you're up your own police force. Yep. Tax is different than than Crown land, you know. But they're heavily subsidized by the government. And they are not allowed to to deal with their own natural resources. Which either. is ridiculous. Sure. I would like to figure out ways like since you already have this system in place, how do we create this as a center of prosperity? How do we create this? How do we build better communities there is in line with protecting nature at the exact same time in line with creating a very sustainable, profitable economy? People want that. And and left to their own awares, they would have these things. Mm. I know that Bradford, West Willenbury, that's the riding that I'm, I'm in that area, York Simcoe, they have the Holland Marsh. Oh, it's nice the land most there. fertile yeah, land yeah. In, in, in Canada. And they want to protect it more than you want to protect it. So putting environmental protection layers on them doesn't make them protect that land anymore. All you're doing is stopping them from developing, mm-hmm. right? And to that end, the conservation authority in this province is, is a terrible joke. And they're really just that they're putting EP layers on whole communities so that you sell at a third of the rate and then they can turn around and develop it with contractors and take the kickback. Jesus. Right? So this is, this is all the, the, the big smoke and mirrors that, that go on. We're, we're doing this to protect the environment. But then 10 years from now, they sell it off to, to the builder anyways. Same thing with our hydro. Sure. I was in the process of, uh, of a cottage, I was mentioning around Midland, Ontario. And uh, it's semi off grid, our own well, septic systems, putting in solar soon, uh, maybe do geothermal as well. Sure. And then I started digging in and realizing, whoa, the energy racket, Ontario. I can, if I have a surplus of energy, it's illegal for me to sell it to you. Wow. Oh. I have to sell it back to Ontario Hydro at a fixed rate, at a pennies on the dollar. Yeah, at a fixed much, rate. It's pretty much free. I'm like, here, take my energy for free. Sure. This is, and that's the only way you can get it back. This is crazy. Sure, it's ridiculous, and and and, and that's the whole thing. And then the other side of that is, in in their angst to set up the green energy, we're we're locked in at thirty years, at like fifteen cents a kilowatt hour mm. for solar, for wind, for these resources that are just terrible. It for the first two years that subsidy helped. After that, it's just straight profit. Those guys are producing it at two, three cents a kilowatt hour and they're, and they're guaranteed 50. Wow. I say rip that contract up. Rip it up. And you know, I, I get told, even by own, my own libertarians, you don't understand contract law. Well, you sure I do. You can't tell me that the billions of dollars that the people pay right now would cost anything compared to what that legal battle would, would cost fighting it on a constitutional level that it's unfair to the people. I'd rather, I'd rather fight that in court then force the people to pay that on the front end. Mm-hmm. Why would we sit back and, and take that? Well, why, why would we just say, oh, well, that's a contract. We have to honor that. It's a bullshit contract and let's not honor it. Let's rip that up and let's do something about it. Mm-hmm. Right? You need political will to do these things. And it, it's not popular conversation. No. But it has to happen. I think it's, it's going to ha- I have a, a big concern. Um, I'm not too concerned in Canada. But anything that happens fast and quick, usually the host environment is not the best. That's right. Fast and quick is not good. No. Communication, slow and steady. Proposals, planning is good. That's right. And so how I see it, and as you mentioned with the community stuff, it'd be really interesting to see the popping up of libertarian leaders across small towns. Sure. That would municipality be, by municipality. Exactly. That would be an interesting strategy. Great. Like your, and, and, not just from having people raise their hands and say, I'm, I'm doing this, but more or less, it's now you're building a community of like-minded individuals that, that's created a decentralized network, per se, right. that can start coordinating different policies. Because my, my policies, as you mentioned, in, let's say, if I lived in middle Ontario, I was like, I, I really don't have the same problems I do if I lived in Mississauga. No. You know? They're, they're, they're worlds apart. Worlds apart. Yes. And so I'm interested to see how we can, to, how we can do that. So, and that's, that's our new platform is, is community-based solutions platform. We're going to have a central platform that's basically about deregulation. Cannabis industry, for example. We're going to opt out of, of the 
the Federal Cannabis Act. We're going to use the notwithstanding clause of the Constitution so that doesn't fit us. We're going to write our own act in, in, in Ontario that says we want to have a, a craft cannabis. You don't have to. Oh, man, they fucked up beyond. They, they, uh, sure. We could have been a world leader for that. I have friends of mine who are, I won't name names, they're in the industry. Ready to go. Buying hundreds and thousands of dollars. You know, I got, I got 17 locations ready. I got the grow houses mm -hmm. going. I'm ready to go. Oh, no. You're not a member of the Liberal Party. You can't grow. And if you look at now, like, I'm not saying you can't become an LP. The, the requirements and the cost. I'm like, you're just pricing everybody out. When, when this all started, I filled out the paperwork just to see. Oh, okay. I wanted to see how it goes. So after about 250 emails back and forth with Health Canada, they finally gave me a temporary approval mm -hmm. on an LP model. $11 million to build my facility. And I'd have to grow my first cycle and they'd have to come in and inspect before I was even considered to get the license. Yeah, you have to put the cash up front. I got to build it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't have to put the cash up front. I got to build it. Yeah. And they got to come in and inspect it. So what happens when I'm a libertarian and Health Canada's liberal friends say, he doesn't deserve that. Yeah. And they, they deny me. So now I've got an $11 million facility. Out of pocket. Worth nothing. Worth nothing. All my investors are like, what the fuck, Keith? Yes. And then I have to sell it for $3 million, probably to the Liberal Party, Chuck Rafisi or whoever else is, is doing their canopy thing now. Mm -hmm. And they're going to buy it at pennies on the dollar, and then they're going to start to grow up. Because they're, of course, going to get that license because they gave 50 bucks a plate or 100 bucks a plate at the dinner. So this is all a big joke. It is. And, and BC was ready to go. And, and, and on top of that, we have the ACMPR program for patients to medically grow. They're already Health Canada approved. Why aren't they immediately asked to fill this void and, and to grow cannabis uh, as, a, as a, you know, a, a, a but why is the alcohol? Why am I allowed to build a craft brewery but not grow craft weed? Well, because they want to corner the market first. And, and the, this whole black market criminals growing cannabis, the only reason that they're criminals is because you say they are. There is no difference between the cannabis that, that this guy's growing from the LP, except his is better because it's small time and he loves it. And this is Franken cannabis growing in a factory that nobody gives a crap about. Right? I agree. I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy you bring up uh, legalities. Sure. Now, one of, the, one of the things with me as a libertarian is we see what the war on drugs have done. Sure. Across the board. Across the board. Heroin, fentanyl, like Oxycontin. That's the biggest joke I've ever seen done by a government. You addict everybody on Oxycontin. The doctors are, are paid kickbacks to put you on these opioids. Then the government says there's a problem with it and you can't hand them out anymore. Immediately cut off the supply. Mm -hmm. And China says, well, you know, you've been, you've been screwing us for 200 years with opium. Let's, fentanyl. let's send you some fentanyl. And now look at the crisis that we're going on. And, and the biggest laughing stock of all of that is you go back to about Mid 2017, they, they went after uh, Mark Emery. Oh, yeah. They yeah, shut the, down the yeah, cannabis product, culture. Yeah, Prince of Park, yeah. Yeah, they shut down the, the, the cannabis culture. They didn't even take any product. They went in, they grabbed his computers and his hard drives because he was instrumental in getting Trudeau elected. Was he? It? Yeah. He pushed hard. Oh, wow. And, and the whole cannabis community followed him and supported them. He took his hard drives because he was no longer supporting them because they rolled it out and they weren't letting him grow. So he started to. to push back and they came and they took all his hard drives. And the joke of that is two blocks up the street is the biggest fentanyl crisis in Canada. People laying and dying on that street. You can't tell me there's not a drug dealer there who's selling that to them. East Hastings. And they walk right by yeah. that to take his hard drives so they can keep him under tow. And he went to jail for seeds. Seeds. Fucking seeds. He did hard time in the U S for that. What was it, like two years or something? Yeah. Well, he, he got five, I believe, but he did fucking D. Don't mess with him. Don't ever cross the border with. But even here in top. Canada, like people like to point fingers at United States for uh, crimes. Yeah. Uh, even in Canada, our stats are not as much, but very similar. Like if you look at offenses in jails, like inmates serving in like provincial and federal jail, a lot of that is drug related. Sure it is. Why why can't you buy cocaine at Shoppers Drug Mart? And I'll tell you why I say that that's a great idea. One, it's not cut. 
You're not going to have to worry about having fentanyl in your cocaine. Mm -hmm. People are going to do what they're going to do. Exactly. You're not going to stop the drug war by, by stamping it and saying it's illegal. Exactly. So why wouldn't you want those people to at least be safe? Every time he walks into Shopper's Drug Mart to buy an eight ball, the guy's going to look at him and say, you know, Bob, you shouldn't do that. Right. And by the time he gets to his third one on a Saturday night, they're going to shut him down. They're going to cut him off just like you do in a bar. You're well, look at the example of Port, uh, uh, Portugal. Yes. They had a 1% heroin addiction before they decriminalized. Wow. And that's the whole population. One in a hundred people so were addicted to, to heroin. And now it's like point zero something. Yeah. It's well off the, the grid. And now there's people who still do it, but they have the, the buses that go around Portugal and they, they have a talk with him and they make sure that he's safe and they, they actually they'll get him a job. You know, if you, well, All you can work is four hours a day. Come work, get you back into society. They, they, they treat these people with respect. Mm -hmm. And when, when you start to give people self-worth, it changes them inside. That's a huge problem in Canada right now. Hopelessness is rampant. That is our mental, that's our mental disability right now is, is there's hopelessness that has just gone crazy in this country. People can't make a living. They, they can't survive. And, and it, it, it takes all of that energy out of you. No wonder people want to take these drugs. And just tune out. I don't blame them. Yeah, it's trauma. Sure. Yeah. It's it's it, it's trauma mitigation is yes. what it is. It's it's I'm I'm so to numb it out. Yeah, I'm so yeah. I'm so messed up, and I have so little hope, and I've got so much anxiety that the only thing I can do is shut off. Mm -hmm. Right, and then you're going to punish him even further. Not that you haven't punished him enough by taking all the value out of his money and, and taxing him to the nth degree, and and making it so that he can't rent a house, and well, he's got a shitty credit rating now because you. He missed a few bills. Now he can't rent a house. And if I was in power of Canada, the first two people to go to the first people to go to jail will be the owners of Equifax. Sure, credit credit scores. It's ridiculous. It's, it's a scam and a half. It's literally the way China's rolling out their their social credit system. Yeah, that's ours is, is Equifax and 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 that credit rating, right? You miss a payment now you're now you can't get a car. You pay more insurance. It's so bad. Like people don't understand. They had two known breaches that we found out about. How many did they not? I'm in the, I want to say I'm in the security space. I understand security. I have a lot of friends in that industry. If we know of two, they've had dozens. That's right. Your SIN number, which is pretty much you. It's not a mirror. It's my SIN number that represents That's who right. I am, whatever it was like, nine digit number. Yep. All gone. Millions of Canadian identity siphoned off to God knows where. And no one got no, not even a slap on the wrist. No. Nothing. No. I had a friend of mine yesterday finally check in on TransUnion, the other guys, and he was dumbfounded at the stuff in there. Now, this is mine. None of this. What the wow. fuck is this? That's crazy. And yet, that's your life. None of this is mine. These, this credit card, that card, I'm like, you're probably one of the guys that got, uh, yeah, they got scammed. Got scammed, yeah. It's, it's funny because I had, uh, I, I, I've, for the first time in my life, I had a purchase made that was not mine. Mm. It was just like a week ago. On your credit card? On, on my Visa debit. Yeah. Someone bought a $107 gym membership. <laughs> I've, I've had everything a fucking gym membership. <laughs> to a, to a, a gym in Greece. Fit science. Interesting. I have no idea. Yeah. So they said it'll take two weeks. I got my money back already within four days because obviously I'm not going to buy a gym membership yeah, yeah. To, to, to a place in Greece, right? That was my first experience with that. But of course it's out there and... and why, if you're a criminal, you're just looking for new ways to, to steal. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a real easy way to do that. What they're doing, they're very sophisticated. Uh, I'll, put the, I'll put the link in the podcast if I find it. It was, they did a case study in, it was in Canada actually, based on the Equifax data breach. And you got to think about how clever these criminals are. So this one person put in their uh, tax claim and most people wait till the end, right? So it's like uh, Jennifer, Mar like March-ish, April, like April's a deadline, whatever the date is, but like March, April, right at the end, like the last like 20 days, like sure. then I'll do it, right? Okay. What these guys did is they front run your income tax with the information they got, the sin and all, that's pretty reverse engineer where you live and all. Sure. So what they did was legal. It was all technically legal. They front ran your taxes fraudulently, obviously. Claiming you know, that they're like H&R Block correct, or something. Correct, correct. Yeah. So people understand like, <coughs> in the United 
I'm not too sure. I'm pretty sure it's kind of similar in the United States, at least in Canada. All taxes are for most part an honor system. Yeah. And then if you get audited, you have to prove here's my receipts, my in, my out, yada, sure. yada, yada. Right. So it's like, this is the proof of what I claimed. Yeah. But they came in and they legally claimed taxes. They had, uh, they had a, a, a front of, a pe- of people, let's call them directors that had bank accounts. Sure. And they claimed people's taxes. And it went for ingenious. I was like, holy shit. Ingenious. And then you come around to claim your taxes at the end. You're <laughs> it's like, already filed. It's already filed. Yeah. And, and refunded to this account here. And then you're on the hook though. Sure. It's under your identity, not this criminal. That's right. And, and, and that's the world we live in today. Yeah. So I, I, I don't know how to protect that, but I, having a, a company that runs legally like Equifax is, is a crime. It's a crime. Sure. We shouldn't have a credit score. No. There should, if, if I've got cash in my pocket, if I've got money in the bank, I should be able to rent something. Mm-hmm. And you shouldn't be able to hold my past discretion. I think, I think we're going to go beyond. I, I think even though I'm not a fan of the fan companies like Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and all them, I view them as a threat to banks. Those are coming for them. Yeah. Like they're coming right now. That's if, when I'm on the debate stage, the NDP, the Green Party, we're coming after Amazon. We're coming after Facebook. As a tech guy, I just don't see what they can do. They want it. They want the money. They want the. Ta- they want to tax these. Guys. I get it. Sure, tax them, sure. but to stop them, like Amazon, uh, Facebook. A- I'll give you an ex- example. Apple Card. Even though I'm not an Apple guy, but I use Amazon. I, it's a love hate relation. I think Amazon, from business practices as a business owner, is like not the best, but like for convenience for me, it's like. Sure. They got one hour delivery for some that's, stuff. That's why McDonald's took off, right? It yeah, wasn't, yeah, it wasn't conven- so good, but it was, but it was there and it was always convenient. Yeah, it was yeah. good for the kids. My memory is playing in the, uh, sure. you know, the, the Going kids. Down the slide yeah, 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 exactly. Right. The little toys too. Of course. Um, and so if I'm using Apple products or if I'm on Facebook or if I'm using Google, they naturally see my behavior. Sure. Just observational. I'm on it. Yeah. They're going to issue me credit. They're the bank now. Sure. I go to the bank. As an entrepreneur, <coughs> for me to get a mortgage or a line of credit, you aren't getting one. Get out of here. You aren't getting one. Amazon gives me credit. There you go. They see my behavior. They give me credit yeah. for my business. Yeah. Without asking. They, they, they probably ask you. They probably say, hey, hey. I, would you like 15? There was literally, I got an email. Would you like $15,000 of credit? There you go. That banks scares the shit out of banks when that happens. Right? Makes them obsolete. And that's why they're coming after them. Yeah. That's that. So these, these other parties, they're, they're, they're in, in the game, right? Once you get to a certain size, you start getting that government money. I haven't had the conversation, but yeah. I swear somebody comes down and says, okay, boys, you're real now. This is how you got to play. Yeah. And if either you play or you, you get squished. We, we haven't made enough of a dent as libertarians to get that conversation yet. Like I said, I, I, I really believe the libertarian movement, and I'm in party, but the philosophy, the movement is ripe for new blood. Sure. It's ripe for attracting. Like what I would love to see is scientists, yes, researchers, professors, mm-hmm. entrepreneurs coming together. Kind yes. Of like, you know, the A team of the most intelligent rational thinkers. And I'm putting a call out to any one of you who are in any of these fields. Come speak to us. Come speak to Matt Doherty. Come speak to myself. Find me. We want you. We want you to be a part of this movement. We, we believe in accountability. We believe in responsibility. We believe in, in science-based decisions. We don't want to knee-jerk anything, and we don't just want to take the needle out of the arm and burn government down. We, we want to make it responsible and accountable for people. And, and we're there. We've, we've, we've all decided that lighting parliament on fire doesn't work. So let's, let's do this responsibly and let's give people back their freedom one piece at a time. Find, find little things that we can do to reduce that size and scope. Of find government. interests, build unity, come together as yes. opposed to burning bridges. That's right. And, and we're all on the same page at the end of the day. I, I really believe that everybody in Canada in their heart, nine out of 10 anyways, is a libertarian. Mm. They just don't understand what that means. We don't want authority. We don't want authoritarian. We're, we don't like Mao Zedong. We don't mm-hmm. want that Pol Pot type of dictatorship. We want to be free to do our own things. That's how we came to Canada. All the immigrants, like, fuck it, I'm coming here. That's right. And that's why we pushed back. And, and back in the day, it was a 3% tax on tea. 
that started the, the revolution in yes. the United States. Oh, yeah, the Boston Tea Party, yeah, yeah. 3%. Yeah. And it's the king stamp. That's, I compare cannabis today to that. It, cannabis is cannabis, but mm -hmm. if it doesn't have the king stamp on it, doesn't have the queen stamp on it, it's mm -hmm. illegal. It's illegal, yeah. Right? And there is no difference between the two. So that's, we need to examine these things. People don't understand what history, our history. Mm. They, they've lost that. And they're not educated enough in the, in the history end of things to realize that we're repeating ourselves. Mm. We're falling right back into that old cycle. Yeah. Or, and and yeah. Then we're, we're slaves again. And, and we need to free ourselves one more time. Beautiful. I think we'll leave it on that note. I like that we'll free ourselves one more time. If people are interested to learn more or to support or to maybe even get a hold of you and talk to you, what's the best resource for people? Uh, email me. Okay. Lead, leader at libertarian.on.ca. I'll make sure I leave that in the show notes. Please do. Thank you so much for coming on and uh, sharing everything about the Libertarian Party. It was my pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>